Uh, next, we have some live readings from the literary arts nonprofit, Quiet Lightning. Yeah, I'm really excited um, about this. And <laughs> Quiet Lightning aims to foster a community based on learning expression and uh, to provide an arena for said expression through readings, uh, a chapbook contest, a film, and now um, a regular, and now as a regular content partner with Transmission, which you heard about earlier. Yeah. Um, so today, uh, we're going to have Evan Karp introduce uh, three amazing writers in the studio to share their work with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first is Rob Bresney, um, and he's searching for the answers so he can destroy them and free up better questions. He writes the syndicated weekly col column, uh, Free Will Astrology, and is author of the Insurrectionary Manifesto, Pranoia is the Antidote to par for Paranoia. And we'll also be hearing from Lori Ann Doyle, who won Alligator Juniper's Fiction Award and a Push Cart Prize nomination. Her work has appeared in Jabberwock Review, Ar Arroyo Literary Review, Under the Sun, and elsewhere. She is co-author of 642 Things to Write About Me, coming from Chronicle Books in 2016. And we'll also be hearing from Charles Kruger, uh, the brainstorming bohemian. Um, he's been active in the Bay Area literary scene with several publications and reading series, including Theater Storm, Bay Area Generations, and the, and the group you're about to see, Quiet Lightning, and he likes to write, too. Um, and we want to remind you before we see them that the number you can call to donate uh, during this telethon is 415-558-2108. Oh, thanks. Hi, I'm Evan. I'm the founder and director of Quiet Lightning. I just wanted to give a little info about what we do. Um, like they said, we're a literary nonprofit. We produce a monthly show. Uh, every month is a submission-based uh, show. We feature all forms of writing. The submissions are read blind by two different curators every month. We've been doing it for five years, and we've had over 40 curators. We publish a book every month and hand it out to the first 100 people featuring all of the writing and artwork by the local artists. We produce a show on SF Commons um, on Channel 29 that airs every uh, second and fourth Thursday. I love BayVac. I hope you'll consider supporting them, and I uh, hope you enjoy these readings. I'll turn it over to Rob Resney now. Thank you guys for tuning in. So the question before us right now is how to keep ourselves in good shape for our travels back and forth to the other real world. First we pretend we mean the opposite of what we are saying as well as what we are saying. We brag about what we can't do and don't have. We make fun of people who make fun of people. We find pleasure everywhere, no matter how hard we have to work at it, even if it's a struggle akin to being born, even if it's a life and death rebellion against our instincts, we find pleasure everywhere. We've got to be adventurous, to be in good shape, to go back and forth between the ordinary real world and the other real world. We have to be adventurous, but not like soldiers, not like mountain climbers, but rather like lucid dreamers who dive down to the bottom of the sea to brush the tangles out of skeleton woman's hair with combs that we made from the rib cage of the Easter Bunny. We've got to be mouthy, smart-ass ad-libbers, but not like anger addicts posting insults on Facebook. Rather, we've got to be like a, a talking buffalo that defends the honor of her friend, the magic frog, against the bloody limericks of the big bad wolf to keep ourselves fit for the other real world. We should explore and celebrate the nihilistic optimism that blooms from total laughing surrender to the puzzling beauty of every single brouhaha and hubbub and, and pandemonium. We should take sly advantage of the fact that the soft destruction of sleep, the nightly apocalypse so faithfully executed by our dreams makes all ideas lies eventually including this one. And we should not 
we should not call it our unconscious mind. Since it's, it's not the un of our conscious, what you may call it, maybe we should call it our outlier or our psychoactivist or super integrator or sphinxissimus. You know, living part time in the other real world isn't right for everyone, but it's right for us. And if we want to generate clues to help us navigate initiations that never end, then we should be alert for omens revealed by the scrawny angels roosting in the branches of the pig nut hickory tree outside the bank on Main Street. We should expect to see an image of the lion goddess floating on a violet puddle of antifreeze in a convenience store parking lot where we go to buy cough syrup at 3 a.m. on a winter night. And, and let's not be too shy to ask the lion goddess for a humble favor. Like, maybe we could ask her to commandeer the dreams of the president and hex him into halting all experts and all exports of F-16 jet fighter planes and Predator drones and Apache attack helicopters and Kentucky Fried Chicken to every charismatic, melodramatic, autocratic figure in the ordinary real world? If we hope to attract miraculous efforts in our attempts to merge the other real world with the ordinary real world as much as possible before we die, we should extract epiphanies from the drool on sleepwalkers' chins as they pass us on our way to collect our prizes, the prizes we have been awarded for transforming our faces into mirrors for the sun. We should conjure oracles from the flight patterns of horseflies that buzz around a trash can where the ex-CEO of a multinational oil company, now homeless and penniless, is foraging for food scraps. We should periodically have a dream in which we sip a wicked apple blitz slurpee from the supernatural golden chalice known as the Holy Grail, and as a result, gain the power to understand the dancing language of the bees and, and to hear the sound of the earth turning and, and to smell the pheromones that willow trees send other willow trees to warn against the attacks of tent caterpillars. Blasphemous reverence. Blasphemous reverence is one of the code phrases that primes our startling bodies for easy travel to and around the other real world. Insurrectionary beauty is another code phrase. Outlaw gratitude. Guerrilla splendor. Ecstatic duty. Sublime mutation. And whenever I'm in the mood to learn more of these magic passwords, I contact my future self telepathically and I say, I would please and thank you like a few fresh tips on how to cultivate lush confusion and embody insane poise and master the blissful wrath of open-hearted rage. I don't want to be dogmatic since endless reinvention is the best rule, but here are some reminders for our sleepy selves, uh, some prayers for our constant undoing. Study the difference between wise suffering and dumb suffering until we get it right. Exaggerate our faults until they turn into virtues. Pretend our wounds are exotic tattoos. Refuse the gifts that infringe on our freedom. Shun sacred places that fill us with boredom. Fantasize that our so-called dark side is sweet and creamy. Change our names every day for a thousand days. Pretend to be crazy so we can get away with doing what's right. Sing anarchist lullabies to homosexual trees. Confess profound secrets to people who are not very interested. Love our enemies just in case our friends turn out to be jerks. 
love everything. Love everything. Love everything slowly and comically and in great detail with intricate, conscientious acts of wild devotion. And I do mean love everything, no matter how stupid or worn out or sick it is, no matter how wealthy or powerful or brilliant it is. What I'm talking about here is a big job, true. It's a time-consuming job, but it's well worth it. Once we get full access to the other real world, once we can go back and forth between here and there with mutinous grace and outlaw gratitude and insane poise, then we will have all the time we could ever possibly need. This is a very short story. The woman next door. She walked into the kitchen, crumpled to her knees, and died, her daughter said. Our houses have stood side by side for more than a century. The walls are so close, I can almost reach out and touch her windowsill. We share a narrow driveway. Standing at the kitchen sink for the first time 16 years ago, I saw the face of the woman next door appear at her window in our mutual slice of morning sun. She was plucking out chin hairs. From upstairs, I watched her position and reposition pots of white cyclamen on her front porch, sop up rainwater. At 10 every night, the bedroom light switched off. At 6 in the morning, the toilet flushed. Her name was Ruth. She had eyes so blue they almost looked white and wore hats. Big beige bowls for gardening, tightly woven black straw for opera and church. If I stopped to say hello, she'd complain the weeds from our side had spread that maple leaves were littering her yard, her blue river stone and moss, grass-free front yard. The wrought iron fence surrounding it rose to sharp points. My husband put in this fence, you know, she told me once. My husband, you know, was chief of staff at the hospital before he passed. So if you ever need anything, I have pull. I took to parking our car on her side just so we'd have something else to talk about. But one day, an invitation came. You like martinis, she said, phoning out of the blue because if you've got the olives, I've got the Bombay. My husband and I drank blue sapphires and watched the A's on Ruth's new 24-inch TV. Her house smelled like cat litter and cough syrup. That was fun, she said, as we stood out on the porch afterward. But bring a light bulb next time, would you? I could use an extra. We laughed, but there was urgency in her voice. When our son was born, she gave him a silver cup with his name engraved across it. Every boy needs one, she said, with no further explanation. Six months ago, I began to see hands in Ruth's window, arms reaching, but no heads. Cars I didn't recognize parked in our driveway. A sister, we heard. A nurse. Another nurse. Doors slammed. The toilet flushed at odd hours. The last time I saw Ruth, she stood inside her black fence. Hello, shoes, she said as I walked closer. She had piled up stones in the corner of her front yard, half burying the yellow flowered sour grass that had grown up. When she asked me when her birthday was, I made something up. She smiled. Goodbye, shoes, she waved to my feet as I left. Two days after Ruth died, a different daughter came to clean out the house. A son rode up in a white motorcycle, put the cat in a crate, and drove off. I watched cardboard boxes being carried down the steps, handmade pottery bowls, a flabby cushion. After the daughter left, we went through the pile left out on the sidewalk 
for pickup. When no one was looking, I took the Christmas present we gave Ruth years ago, a stainless steel cocktail shaker still in its box, along with an unraveling roll of fleur-de-lis shelf paper. Two weeks ago, a couple with a baby due next month moved in. An upright piano sits on the porch, and the bedroom light comes on and goes off whenever it wants. This morning, I caught the woman next door, the, woman, the one I've never met, staring at me as the sun filled the glass of the window. I looked away, looked back, but still she was staring, as if my face, too, might suddenly disappear. Thank you. These are four psalms for the San Francisco Bay Area. Each one has a title and is also associated with a particular place in the Bay Area. Number one, Epiphany, Church and 23rd in San Francisco. I got to town early and thought I'd drive up to Twin Peaks and see if I can make a poem. But then I thought, I don't have time. I don't have time to climb those hills. I had better hang out right here in the valley. I have to hurry up before it's too late. I can't waste time scouring the hillsides for poetry. So I park my car and watch the fog scurrying down the hill to chase itself through the open windows of the Victorian houses and the silver light reflected. Off the bay shimmers in the cool San Francisco summer air. And I happily remember that all the poetry I'll ever need is right here, right now. Number two, the poetry reading, Moe's Bookstore, Telegraph Avenue, Berkeley. Two poets reading, one in black, one in white, fluorescent lights and concrete floor, echoing footsteps of rousing customers. And we, the small group of auditors, silent and listening. Composition, we are told, is an absolute mystery. Matter and spirit are secret lovers. In a park in Mill Valley, all the birds fall silent but the crows. And here in Moe's, on this Thursday night, all the world falls silent but the poets and the echoing mystery of this composition answering their gentle voices. We are listening to each other and learning to love. Number three is our search for meaning. Vera Kocher, 21st at Valencia. One time, I took directions from a Santero and left a coconut under a palm tree as a sacrifice for Shango. I asked him to send me a lover, and he did. I have a room in my house where I placed a scary mask over the door to keep out demons, and once I found two yolks in a single egg. And when I eat a fish, I always look for the genie's ring. There was the time, too, when I sat by a stream, rubbing two walks together for an hour, hoping for a vision which finally came in the form of a tree stump in the shape of a bear who spoke to me of love and the future. And once on a country highway, I tried to hitch a ride, and nobody stopped but the trees and the sky and I were perfect. 
And will I ever get back to a moment like that? 40 years ago, and I cannot forget. Give me significance, I cry out, even at the expense of truth. Grant me relief from doubt, parched for meaning I would drink seawater and superstition for relief. O oh Lord, my soul is longing for you like a dry, weary land without water. Give me a horoscope, give me a magic ring, a song to sing, a, a coat of many colors, and an eye to see. O oh Lord, make me holy. And what is holy? Holy is that which signifies beyond itself. That would be you. That would be me. That would be us. Amen. And finally, number four, a monkish prayer, Incarnation Monastery, Berkeley. Lord, lead us into the darkness that is night. Surround us with a silence that is song. Establish us in the stillness that is activity. And Lord, shine upon us the light that is darkness. Sing to us the song that is silence. Teach us the activity that is stillness. Be with us all ways. <laughs>